Hello my dear trainees, how are you? Hope you're doing really well. This is your brother Ryan and I am going to be your host and trainer for the program Creative Problem Solving. Welcome to the Creative Problem Solving Workshop. In the past few decades, psychologists and business people alike have discovered that successful problem solvers tend to use the same type of process to identify and implement the solutions to their problems. This process works for any kind of problem, large or small. This workshop will give you an overview of the entire creative problem solving process, as well as key problem solving tools that you can use every day. In, mo in module one, what we're going to do is we're going to get started. We are going to get started by talking about the things that you need to know which are of vital importance if you want to be a good problem solver. So now we do need to know that. This is a an online workshop. It is a webinar. I cannot see you and uh, we cannot, you know, like give and take. So what I want you to do is to participate. I want you to take notes. I want you to jot down whatever you can jot down and prepare because there may be some pop-up quizzes, there may be some um, uh, research uh, thesis statements that you have to submit and there may be some assignments. So please stay with me, bear with me and stay focused until the end of this webinar. The workshop objectives. Research has consistently demonstrated that when clear goals are associated with learning, that the learning occurs more easily and rapidly. With that in mind, let's review our goals for today. By the end of this workshop, you will be able to understand problems and the creative problem solving process. You will be able to identify types of information to gather and key questions to ask in problem solving. You will be able to identify the importance of defining a problem correctly. You will be able to identify and use four different problems, problem definition tools. You will be able to write concrete problem statements. You will be able to use basic brainstorming tools to generate ideas for solutions. You will be able to use idea generating tools such as affinity diagrams, word chaining, the box method, the six thinking hats, and the blind method. You will be able to evaluate potential solutions against criteria including cost benefit, analysis and group voting. You will, you will be able to perform a, an analysis, a final analysis to select a solution. You will be able to understand the roles that fact and intuition play in select, selecting a solution. You will be able to understand the need to refine the short list and redefine it. You will be able to understand how to identify the tasks and resources necessary to implement solutions. You will be able to evaluate and adapt solutions to reality. Last but not least, you will be able to follow up with solution implementation to celebrate success and identify improvements. Module 2, the problem solving method. To begin, let's look at the creative problem solving process. In this module, we will define problem and other situations that lend themselves to the creative problem solving process. We will introduce the concept of solving problems using a creative process. The approach we use in this course includes six steps, which are also introduced in this module. What is a problem? When you hear the word problem, what comes to your mind? Let's look at this quote by Norman Vincent Peale. Every problem has in its seeds of its own solution. If you don't have any problems, you don't get any seeds. So what is a problem? What comes to your mind when we say problem? 
the random house unibridged, unibridged dictionary includes several definitions for the word problem. The definitions that we are most concerned with while learning about the creative problem solving process are any question or matter involving doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty, and a question proposed for solution or discussion. A problem can be defined as a scenario in which the current situation does not match the desired situation or any time actual performance does not match expectations. Other labels for a problem include challenges or opportunities or any situation or circumstance for which there is room for improvement. So here is an assignment I want you to jot down with your pen, please. This is an assignment uh, you have to try. You have to try this assignment out, and the objective of this 10-minute assignment is to understand what constitutes a problem and other situations that lend themselves to the creative problem-solving process. And here is the topic summary. Is your pen in hand? Please, if your pen is in hand, write this down. If your pen is not in hand, do grab a pen and make sure you write this down so that you can benefit the most. Topic summary. A problem occurs any time that reality does not meet expectations. Problems can have other labels such as challenges or opportunities. Now here is the activity. I want you to share problems that you want to solve from your organization or home lives. Write it down, seven problems that you want to be solved, seven of your problems that you would love to be solved. Write it down and then later on you will send it to us via email, including your name, last name, and your contact details. So we see in the problem stages or the problem definition, we see doubt, uncertainty, undesired situation, challenges, and opportunities. So what is creative problem solving? Because there is a difference. There is problem solving and there is creative problem solving. And creative problem solving has evolved since its inception in the 1950s. However, it is always a structured approach to finding and implementing solutions. The creative problem solving process involves creativity. The problem solvers come up with solutions that are innovative rather than obtaining help to learn the answers or implementing standard procedures. The creative problem solving process is at work any time you identify solutions that have value or that somehow improve a situation for someone. Here is another assignment that I want you to work on really hard. Now, it's a 10-minute assignment. It will take no longer than 10 minutes of your time. And the objective of it is to define creative problem solving. The topic summary Creative problem solving is a structured approach to finding and implementing new solutions to areas where there is need for improvement. So what you need is a pen and a paper. And list your problems. Write the following list on a piece of paper. This is your planning checklist. Number one. Improving market share of a product. Number two, learning to play an instrument. Number three, diagnosing an illness with a number of subtle usual symptoms. Number four, handling high employee turnover. Number five, figuring the cost per unit for a bulk purchase. Now use these five dots, these five points that we just mentioned, use them as examples and identify some of your problems. You're not going to use these 
points as problems, as your problems, but you will use them as examples. Here is our recommended activity. Review the list with a friend or a colleague or a spouse and determine which items are appropri appropriate for the creative problem solving process. Here are our answers. Improving market share of a product? Yes. Learning to play an instrument? No. Diagnosing an illness with a number of subtle usual symptoms? Yes. Handling high employee turnover? Yes. Figuring the cost per unit? For a bulk purchase? No. So what were the review questions in this example? What is the difference between creative problem solving and implementing well-known solutions? Now you need to know, after you do this assignment, you need to know what are the steps in the creative solving process. The creative problem solving process uses six major steps to implement solutions to almost any kind of problem. There are six steps. Number one, information gathering or understanding more about the problem before proceeding. You need to understand the problem. You need to gain as many details as possible about this problem so that you can further proceed with the creative problem solving process. Number two, problem definition. Define your problem or making sure you understand the correct problem before proceeding. Number three, generating possible solutions using various tools. Number four, analyzing possible solutions or determining the effectiveness of possible solutions before proceeding. Number five, selecting the best solutions. So what you're going to do is in number three you will generate the possible solutions using different tools. Then you analyze the possible solutions or determine the effectiveness. Which one is the most effective solution? Which one will benefit you the most and help you solve your problem? After that you will select. First you analyze and then you select the best solution or solutions. Last but not least, planning the next course of action, the next steps, or implementing the solutions. So number one, information gathering. Number two, problem definition. Number three, possible solutions. Number four, next course of action. Number five, selecting the best solutions. Number six, analyzing possible solutions. Module three, information gathering, which was the first step to creative so problem solving. The first step in the creative problem solving process is to gather information about the problem. In order to effectively solve the correct problem, you need to know as much about it as possible. In this module, we will explode different types of information. Explode or explore. We will explode as in, you know, boom, give you the different types of information you need. Or we can explore as in do research and go further, look further into this. The types of information you need the key questions you need to ask, the different methods used to gather information. Understanding types of information. There are many different types of information. And the following list of information you will need to consider when beginning the creative problem solving process is number one, fact. Number two, opinion. Number three, Opinionate, opinionated fact. Number four, concept. Number five, assumption. Number six, procedure. Number seven, process. Number eight, principle. These are the understanding types of information. 
Facts are a small piece of well-known data. Facts are based. Facts are based on objective details and experience. Opinions are also based on observation and experience. But they are subjective and can be self-serving. When a fact and opinion are presented together, it is an opinionated fact, which may, tr which may try to indicate the significance of a fact, suggest generalization, or attach value to it. Opinionated facts are often meant to sway the listener to a particular point of view using the factual data. Concepts. Concepts are general ideas or categories of items or ideas that share common features. Concepts are important pieces of information to help make connections or to develop theories or hypotheses. Assumptions. Assumptions are a type of concept or hypotheses in which something is taken for granted. Procedures are a type of information that tells how to do something with specific steps. Processes. Processes are a slightly different describing continuous actions or operations to explain how something works or operates. Principles. Principles are affected rules or fundamental laws or doctrines often described in actions or conduct. So here's another assignment. Please jot this down immediately. This is a 15-minute assignment. We don't have so many assignments. Don't feel weak. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. This work needs to be done in order for you to earn your certificate and become licensed. So please, give in all your efforts to this course and do not lose your enthusiasm nor your energy. Now the objective of this workshop is to understand different types of information. There are several different types of information to consider in the creative problem solving process. And all you need is a paper and a pen and to list a, a list of information examples. Let me tell you what to do before the workshop and what you should do. Write the following list on the flip chart. Number one, the computer system is too hard to learn. Number two, the 45 fish died. Number three, the restaurant garden space is half of an acre or one-fifth, let's say one-fifth of an acre. Number four, the substance is red. Number five, a new computer system is too expensive to implement. Number six, to wash your hands, first wet your hands, then add soap. Rub your hands to lather the soap. Last but not least, rinse off the soap. Number seven, the water cycle includes the evaporation of water, the condensation of water vapor into clouds, rain, and water flowing in streams and rivers back to lakes and seas. Number eight, Gravity causes dropped objectives to always fall to the ground principle. Now, let's review this. Let's review these points. I, I hope you jotted down everything. I know you probably didn't get every single point, but as long as you heard the sentence, and you jotted some points down, that is good. It's good enough. Okay, so let's go to number one. 
the computer system is too hard to learn. What is this? It is an opinion. It is an opinion. Why? Because the computer system is too hard to learn in your view. That's what you think. But it may be easy to learn in somebody else's view. So what is this? It is an opinion. It is not a fact. But what is an opinionated fact? Here we go. Number two, only 45 fish died. Only 45 fish died. This is a fact. 45 fish died. It is an opinionated fact. Opinions are based on observation and experience, right? And facts are small pieces of well-known data. Facts are based on objective details and experience. So what is an opinionated fact? This is a good question. Let's go back to it again. An opinionated fact is an opinion slash fact. An opinion slash fact. You put your opinion plus the fact as well. Because facts are small pieces of well-known data. Facts are based on objective details and experience. Opinions are also based on observation and experience. So 45, only 45 fish died. Where is the opinion and where is the fact? 45 fish died. That is the fact. Only 45 fish died. It becomes an opinionated fact. Number three, the restaurant garden space is one-fifth of an acre. That is a fact. Number four, the substance is red. Red is a concept. What is a concept? A concept, as we said earlier, Concepts are general ideas or categories or items. Items or ideas that share common features. Concepts are important pieces of information to help make connections or to develop theories or hypotheses. A new computer, another point, a new computer system is too expensive to implement this is an assumption. A new computer system is too expensive to implement. This is an assumption. What is an assumption? No, this time I'm asking you. What is an assumption? Okay, let me help you out. Assumptions are a type of concept or hypothesis in which something is taken for granted. Assumptions are a type of concept or hypothesis in which something is taken for granted. So this activity can be, be performed in like a small group if you have like some family members, siblings, do work on this activity I gave you an example and now it's your turn to put it into action and work on a real activity. All we mentioned just now in these last few minutes were just examples. I was helping you out on your activity. So please do submit this and make sure you have a review question. Let me give you an example review question. What are some of the different types of information? Moving into the next point, identifying key questions. When tackling a new problem, it is important to talk to anyone who might be familiar with the problem. You can gather a great deal of information by asking questions of different people who might be affected by or know about the problem. 
remember to ask people with years of experience in the organization, the lower level employees. Sometimes their insights can provide valuable information about a problem. What other questions should you ask? The key questions will be different for every situation. Questions that begin with the following are always a good starting point. Who, what, which, why, when, why, where, how. Sorry, I mentioned why twice. Let's repeat that again. Who, what, which, where, when, why, how. Here are some examples of more specific questions. Who initially defined the problem? What is the desired state? What extent is the roof being damaged? Where is the water coming from? When did the problem finish or when did the employee finish his training? How can we increase our market share? Which equipment is working? One important source of information on a problem is to ask if it has been solved before. Find out if anyone in your company or network has, been, has had the same problem. This can generate the great information about the problem and potential solutions. Let's talk about the methods of gathering information. When gathering information about a problem, there are several different methods you can use. No one method is better than another. The method depends on the problem and other circumstances. Here are some of the ways you can collect information about a problem. Number one, conduct interviews. Have an interview with the person. Get more information about this problem. Identify and study statistics. Numbers never lie. Always compare and identify using statistics. Send questionnaires out to employees, customers, or other people concerned with the problem. Conduct technical experiments. Experiments are great ways to gather information on of the problem. Observe the procedures or processes in question firsthand. Last but not least, create focus groups to discuss the problem. Moving into module number four, we will talk about the problem definition. What I want you to do right now is to take a deep breath and stand up, please. If you are sitting down, stand up, take a deep breath, stretch yourself out, move your arms up, put them all the way up, stretch your arms, then take a deep breath again, really slowly, in, inhale, in it, inhale the breath, the oxygen in, within five seconds, hold it in, and then exhale within three seconds. Very good. Now you can sit down so we can move into the module number four, problem definition. And I thank you for attending this course and signing up with us and I assure you that you will end this course with some benefit. Problem definition. The next step in the creative problem solving process is to identify the problem. This module will explore why problem solvers need to clearly define the problem. It also introduces several tools to use when defining a problem and writing a problem statement. Defining a problem is very important. Without defining the problem, you cannot solve it. And there are steps for defining the problem. Please jot this down with your pen and paper so that you can actually put this into work and try it out and see if it works or not. Defining the problem is the first step in the creative problem solving process. When a problem comes to light, it may not be clear exactly what the problem is. You must understand the problem before you spend time or money implementing a solution. 
it is important to take care in defining the problem. The way that you define your problem influences the solution or solutions that are available. Problems often can be defined in many different ways. You must address the true problem when continuing the creative problem solving process in order to achieve a successful solution. You may come up with a terrific solution, but if it is a solution to the wrong problem, it will not be a success. In some cases, take an action to address a problem before adequately identifying the problem is worse than doing nothing. It can be a difficult task to sort out the symptoms of the problem before from the problem itself. However, it is important to identify the underlying problem in order to generate the right solutions. Now problem solvers can go down with wrong path with possible solutions if they do not understand the true problem. These possible solutions often only treat the symptoms of the problem and not the real problem itself. Four tools to use in the problem solving, defining is number one, determining. Determining where the problem originated. Defining the present state and the desired state. Stating, the, stating and restating the problem. Last but not least, analyzing the problem. You may not use all of these tools to help define a problem. Different tools lend themselves to some kinds of problem better than other kinds. So let's start with the first one, and that is determining where the problem originated. Successful problem solvers, successful problem solvers get to the root of the problem by interviewing or questioning anyone who might know something useful about the problem. Ask questions about the problem. Include questions such as clarifying the situation, challenging assumptions about the problem, determining possible reasons and evidence, explore different perspectives concerning the problem. Ask more about the original question. If you did not get or if you did not define the problem, find out who did. Think about the person's motivations, motivations, challenge their assumptions to dig deeper into the problem. Defining the state, the present state and the desired state. When using this tool, you write a statement of the situation as it currently exists. Then you write a statement of what you would like the situation to look like. The desired state should include concrete details and should not contain any information about possible causes or solutions. Refine the descriptions for each state until the concerns until the concerns and needs identified in the present state are addressed in the desired state. Stating and restating the problem. The problem statement and restatement techniques technique also helps evolve the understanding of the problem. First, write a statement of the problem, no matter how vague. Then use various triggers to help identify the true problem. The triggers are, number one, as you see right in front of you, place emphasis on different words in the statement and ask questions about each emphasis. Number two, replace one word in the statement with a substitute that explicitly, explicitly, expli explicitly <laughs> that is a hard word. All right, let's just repeat that again, number two. Replace one word in the statement with a substitute that explicitly defines the word to reframe the problem. There we go. 
Number three, rephrase the statement with positives instead of negatives or negatives instead of positives to obtain an opposite problem. Number four, add or change words that indicate quantity or time, such as always, never, sometimes, every, none, or some. Number five, identify any persuasive or opinionated words in the statement. Replace or eliminate them. That was number four, and now uh, we will talk about number five. Try drawing a picture of the problem or writing the problem as an equation. Next, we will talk about analyzing the problem. When the cause of the problem is not known, such as in troubleshooting operations, you can look at the what, where, who, and extent of the problem to help define it. Number one, what? What questions help to identify the problem? Use what questions both to identify what the problem is as well as what the problem is not. What questions can also help identify a possible cause? Where? Where questions help to locate the problem? Use where questions to distinguish the difference between locations where the problem exists and where it does not exist. When? When questions help discover the timing of the problem. Use when questions to distinguish the difference between when the problem occurs and when it does not, or when the problem was first observed and when it was last observed. Extent. Questions that explore the magnitude of the problem include how far versus how localized, how many units are affected versus how many units are not affected, how much of something is affected versus how much of something is not affected. You see, examining the distinctions between what, where, when, and to what extent the problem is, and what, where, when, and to what extent it is not can lead to helpful insights about the problem. Remember to sharpen these statements as the problem becomes clearer. Writing the problem statement is an important factor. Writing an accurate, an accurate problem statement can help accurately represent the problem. This helps clarify unclear problems. The problem statement can, may evolve through the use of the four problem definition tools and any additional information gathered about the problem. As the statement becomes more refined, the types and effectiveness of potential solutions are improved. The problem statement should include specific details about the problem, including who, what, when, where, and how. Address the scope of the problem to identify boundaries of what you can reasonably solve. The problem statement should not include any mention of possible causes, and it should not include any potential solutions. A detailed, clear, and concise problem statement will provide clear cut goals for focus and direction for coming up with solutions. Hope that is clear, and now we will move into module number five preparing for brainstorming. Very exciting details in this module, so please stay with me, bear with me, take a deep breath, and grab your favorite beverage that is around you. If, you can, you know, if there is water around you, go grab a glass of water. If there is Kool-Aid around you, grab that glass of Kool-Aid. But if there is no drink around you, then still go and grab yourself a drink, but make it really quick. Thank you. 
Module number five, preparing for brainstorming. Before we learn ways to generate solutions in the problem solving process, we will prepare the way for creativity. This module introduces common mental blocks to productive brainstorming, as well as techniques for dealing with the mental blocks. It also presents some ideas for stimulating creativity. Identifying mental blocks. Brainstorming can help you arrive at a solution to the problem. Even for problems that seem un, you know, problems that you cannot solve, unsolvable, or that seem only to only have inadequate solutions. However, before beginning a successful brainstorming session to generate ideas, you must re remove any mental blocks. Mental blocks can eliminate great solutions before they are thoroughly examined and other solutions as well. But remember, these solutions have to be thoroughly examined as possibilities or string boards to other possible solutions. There are many types of mental blocks. Most blocks to problem solving fit into the following categories emotions, distractions, assumptions, culture, emotions, distractions, assumptions, culture, and communication difficulties. What do we mean by emotions? Emotional blocks can include anything from a fear of risk taken to a tendency to judge or approach the problem with a negative attitude. What do we mean by distractions? Distractions such as too much information, irrelevant information, or environmental distractions, these all can prevent a productive brainstorming session. Assumptions. If problem solvers assume there is only one correct solution, they will be unable to generate additional ideas. Assumptions also become mental blocks from stereotypes or perceived boundaries where none exist. Culture. Culture defines the way we live and limits the ideas we may generate or consider. However, not every culture is the same. Sometimes the cultural blocks are unnecessary and sometimes we do not consider cultural limitations when we should. Last but not least, communication difficulties. If we cannot communicate our ideas in some way, speaking, writing, or pictures, these communication difficulties can block our progress in generating ideas. Imagine not having communication skills, and you want to solve a problem, and you have to ask questions, and you have to do an interview, and you have to generate ideas, and you have to gather information. If you do not have proper communication skills, you will not be able to properly or effectively do all of these techniques. Fulfill the techniques of solving your problem. It will be quite impossible. So solve the problem by learning communication skills. Next we move into removing mental blocks. So what do you do when you identify a mental block. Carol Gorman has identified several, she has identified several structured techniques for block busting. The first technique is an attitude adjustment. To remove blocks arising from a negative attitude, list the positive aspects or possible outcomes of the problem. Remember that problems are also opportunities for improvement. The next technique deals with risk taken. To remove emotional blocks arising from a fear of failure, define the risk, then indicate why it is important. Define what the worst possible outcome might be and what opportunities there are in that scenario. Think about how to deal with that possible failure. The next technique encourages you to break the rules. 
Some rules are important, but when rules create an unnecessary imaginary boundary, they must be disregarded so the problem solvers can come up with innovative solutions. The fourth technique is to allow imagination, feelings, and a sense of humor to overcome a reliance on logic and a need to conduct problem solving in a step-by-step -step manner. The fifth technique involves encouraging your creativity. We'll look into that with more detail in the next topic. Stimulating creativity. The creativity or the creative problem solving process requires creativity. However, many people feel that they are not creative. This is the sign of a mental block at work. Everyone can tap into creative resources in their brains. Sometimes it just takes a little extra prodding. Creativity is not something to be turned on and off when needed. The potential for creativity is always there. We just need to learn how to access it. And here are some tips. Tips for creating a creative mental space to encourage productive brainstorming sessions. Number one, go outside for a few minutes, especially for a nature walk or bike ride. Exercising and getting sunshine even for just a few minutes are sure ways to redirect your brain to a more creative outlook. Change your perspective. Work on the floor or go to the park for your brainstorming session. Breathe deeply, especially when you're stressed. We tend to become shallow breathers. Fill your entire lungs with air to get some extra oxygen to your brain. Practice deep breathing for 5 to 15 minutes for not only more creativity, but for a great burst of energy. Meditate. Focus intently on a candle flame or find another way to quiet your mind of all of your responsibilities and distractions. For a group, try guided meditation. Write a journal. Write a 15 to 20 minute journal in a spare notebook or plain paper. It doesn't have to be about the specific problem you need to solve, but you may discover some mental blocks if you do not write about the problem. Dump all of your mental clutter onto one to three pages that no one will ever see, unless you want them to. Then let the pages and the recorded thoughts go even if just in your mind. Once you get your creative juices flowing, keep them going by trying the following ideas every day. Number one, carry a small notebook or jot down ideas in your PDA. Number two, be prepared for ideas whenever they come. Ideas often come as you are drifting off to sleep or as you are walking. Number three, stretch your boundaries by posing new questions to yourself. Learning things outside your specialty or breaking up set a set of patterns of doing things. Number four, be receptive to new, fragile ideas that may still need time to develop. Be observant of details, including self-details.
observe yourself. Observe details, small details. But don't take it to extreme. Do not take anything to, to extreme. Stay in the middle and be moderate with your observations so that you don't become one of those people who are like, you know, psychologically affected by observing so many details. <laughs> you don't want to get sick like that from my advice, especially not from me. Last but not least, find a creative hobby, including working puzzles and playing games. Module number six. Hope everything is clear so far. You will probably have to look into this webinar again. You will have to read the training manual over and over a few times until you grasp everything. You will have to take notes as I speak for you to understand clearly every detail and acknowledge. Module number six, we have completed five modules. Now we are moving into module number six, and that is generating solutions. Generating possibilities for solutions to the defined problem comes next in the process. It is important to generate as many solutions as possible before analyzing these solutions or trying to implement them. There are many different, different methods for generating solutions. This module begins with some ground rules for brainstorming sessions. Then it presents several ideas generating techniques including free association style brainstorming brain writing, brain, uh, mind mapping, and Duckner diagrams. So you need to understand the brainstorming basics. In order to come up with a good idea, you must come up with many ideas, with as many ideas as possible. The first rule of brainstorming is to come up with as many ideas as you possibly can. Some of the ideas will not be so good. If you start analyzing the ideas while you are generating them, the creative process will quickly come to a halt. And you may miss out on some great ideas. Therefore, the second rule for brainstorming sessions is to defer judgment. Allow creativity and imagination to take over in this phase of the process. The next rule for brainstorming is to come up with the wildest, most imaginative solutions to your problem that you can. Often we might not consider a solution because of assumptions or associational constraints. However, sometimes those solutions, even if you do not end up implementing them, can lead you to a successful, a successful solution. So along with deferring judgment, allow those ideas that might be considered crazy to flow. One of those crazy ideas might just contain the seeds of the perfect solution. Finally, use early ideas as springboards to other ideas. This is called piggybacking and is the next rule for brainstorming. Basic brainstorming. Basic brainstorming is a free association session of coming up with ideas. Use the other group members' ideas, the other group, the other team, whatever it is that you are working with to gather ideas. Use their ideas to trigger additional ideas. One member of the group should make a list of all of the ideas. By doing so, the solution will easily occur and will come into existence and will solve your problem. Brain writing and mind mapping. Brain writing and mind mapping. Repeat after me. Brain writing and mind mapping. They are two additional tools to generate ideas. Brain writing. Brain writing is similar to free association brainstorming, except that it is conducted in silence. 
This method encourages participants to pay closer attention to the ideas of others and piggyback on those ideas. Before a brain write-in session, create sheets of paper with a grid of nine squares on each sheet. You will need as many sheets as there are participants in the brain write-in session. With one or two extra sheets, plan to sit participants in a circle or around a table. Determine how long the session will last and remind participants that there is no talking. Remind partic participants of the other rules for brainstorming, especially deferring judgment. For the session itself, state the problem or challenge to be resolved. Each participant fills out three ideas on a brain writing grid. Then he or she places that brain writing sheet in the center of the table and selects a new sheet. Before writing additional ideas, the participants read the three ideas at the top generated by a different participant. The hope is that these items will suggest additional ideas to the participants. The participants should not write down the same ideas that they have written on the other sheets. This activity continues until all of the grids are full or the time runs out. At the end of the activity, there should be many ideas to consider and discuss. Mind mapping. Mind mapping is another method of generating ideas on paper, but can be conducted alone. The problem solver starts by writing one main idea in the center of the paper. Write additional ideas around the sheet of paper, circling the idea and connecting the ideas with the lines. This technique allows for representing nonlinear relations between ideas. Dunker diagrams are used with the present state and desired state. Statements discussed in Module 4, a Dunker diagram generates solutions by creating possible pathways from the present state to the desired state. However, the Dunker diagram also addresses an additional pathway of solving the problem by making it okay not to reach the desired state. Let's take a short break for two minutes and then we will continue on the Dunker diagram. You are dismissed for two minutes. You may pause this or you may keep it playing and just come back in two minutes so that we can continue. Thank you.
Welcome back, my dear attendees, my participants. Hope you are back in your seats and ready to continue this journey of creative problem solving. Let's continue. We stopped at Dunker Diagrams. Dunker dry Diagrams can help with refining the problem as well as generate, generating ideas for solutions. It helps you. The diagram begins with general solutions, as you see right in front of you. Then it suggests functional solutions that give more specifics on what to do. The diagram can also include specific solutions of how to complete each item in the functional solutions. For example, Michael wanted to address the problem of his job being too stressful. He is responsible for managing up to 1,500 work hours per month. He cannot find a way to complete all of his tasks within a desired work week of no more than 45 to 50 hours per week. He has over 10 years experience in public account and is interested in moving into industry. However, he's so busy. He's so busy that he does not even have time to look for a new, jo new job. So we have a present state and desired state, right? Present state, job requires more demands on my time than I am willing to dedicate to a job I do not really care about. Desired state, work a job I care about with adequate free time to spend with family and pursuing some interests. Module number seven, generating solutions. This module presents additional tools and information to consider when generating solutions as part of the creative problem solving process. The morphological matrix, Fritz Zwicky developed a method for general morphological analysis in the 1960s. The method has been applied to many different fields. It is a method of listing examples of different attributes or issues to an item or problem and randomly combining the different examples to form a solution, depending on the number of issues or attributes identified. There can be quite a large number of possible combinations. The morphological matrix is a grid with several different columns. The problem solvers enter a specific attribute or issue about the item or problem at the top of each column. Then for each column, problem solvers generate a list of examples for that attribute. Once there are many different ideas in the columns, the solutions can be combined strategically or randomly. While some combinations naturally are incompatible, problem solvers should not rule out ideas until they reach the analysis phase of the problem solving process. For complex problems, computer assisted morphological assessment can be done for complex problems. However, for the scope of this course, we will look a simple example that can be done by hand. As an example, let's look at the traffic problems, problems experienced at a new elementary school. The administrative staff of the school has identified the problem statement as get approximately 500 students to class safely on time and with no more than a five minute wait for parents and drivers in the neighborhood. A few samples or a few sample attributes to this problem are safety, timeliness, pedestrians, and drivers. Safety, as you see in the chart in front of you on the left side, extra cross guards, policemen given tickets for rule breakers, timeliness, stagger arrival time by grade, provide incentives 
for dropping off early. Pedestrians cross only at crosswalks with crossing guards. Pedestrians enter at south entrance. Drivers, students being dropped off from cars or buses, enter at north entrance. Lane for drop off, lane for passing. This matrix can help identify different considerations of the problem, can also help formulate comprehensive solutions to complex problems. Then we will move into the six thinking habits. And I'm sure you've heard of this before. Dr. Edward D. Bono introduced a concept for thinking more effectively in groups in his book, Six Thinking Hats. The premise of this idea is that the brain thinks about things in a number of different ways. The identified different categories of thought are assigned to a color-coded hat, as described. The hats provided provide a structured way to think about different aspects of a problem. The white hat, facts and information. This hat includes information collected or identified as missing. The red hat, feelings and emotion. This hat includes gut reactions to ideas or items identified in another area. The black hat, critical judgment. This hat includes details about obstacles to solving the problem or other negative connotations about an item or idea. Since people are naturally critical, it is important to limit black hat thinking to its appropriate role. The yellow hat, positive judgment. This hat is the opposite of the black hat. It includes details about the benefits of an idea or issue, or thoughts about favoring an idea. It is still critical thinking and judgment, as opposed to blind optimism. The green hat, alternatives and learning. This hat concerns ideas about new possibilities and thinking about implications rather than judgments. The green hat thinking covers the full spectrum of creativity. Last but not least, the blue hat, the big picture. This hat serves <clears throat> as the facilitator of the group thinking process. This hat can be used to set objectives both for the problem solving process and the thinking session itself. This hat or the six thinking hat methodology allows a deliberate focus in during problem solving sessions with an agreed upon sequence and time limit to each hat. It ensures that everyone in the group is focused on a particular approach at the same time rather than having one person reacting emotionally. Red hat while others are being objective white hat. Red Hat reacting emotionally, White Hat being objective. And still, another is wearing the Black Hat to form critical judgments of ideas. The Green Hat is the main thinking hat for generating solutions in the problem solving process. The Green Hat. It's the main thinking hat to generate solutions. The other hats can be used as a reminder of the rules of productive brainstorming sessions, such as limiting critical judgment, positive and negative, yellow and black hats. To move further into this, we talked about the six thinking hats and we mentioned the different types. Now we want to talk about something that is also important in problem solving, in the process of problem solving, and that is the blink method. The blink method. Malcolm Gladwell, 
popularizes scientific research about the power of the adaptive unconscious in his book Blink. Have you ever heard of this book? Blink. The power of thinking without thinking. Gladwell's premise is that in an age of information overload our decisions based on limited information are often as good or um, as or better than decisions made with ample critical thinking. In the examples and research Gladwell presents, experts and average subjects alike are better able to happier and happier, not too happier and happier, with choices made through what he calls thin slicing, or coming to a conclusion with limited information. An example presented is the case in which many experts identify a statue as a fake. When the museum that spent money on the statue did not identify it as such with weeks of research. Gladwell also presents the caution of the adaptive unconscious. Our power to make effective decisions by tapping into this power can be corrupted by personal likes and dislikes and stereotypes. Rapid intuitive judgment can have disastrous consequences. As presented in his example of an innocent man shout, shot on his own doorstep 41 times by a New York policeman. Gladwell summarizes the dilemma between when to tap into our unconscious and when to use a more critical approach as thus on straightforward choices deliberate analysis is best when questions of analysis and personal choice start to get complicated when we have to juggle many different variables then our unconscious thought process may be superior and that is where module 8 comes analyzing solutions with many different solutions in hand, the problem solvers need to analyze these solutions to determine the effectiveness of each one. This module helps you or participants consider the criteria or goals of solving the problem as well as distinguishing between wants and needs. This module also introduces the cost-benefit analysis as a method of analyzing solutions. Developing criteria. Return to the information generated when defining the problem. Consider who, what, when, where, and how that the potential solution should meet to be an effective solution to the problem. When developing criteria that possible solutions to the problem should meet, also consider the following. Ask questions such as, wouldn't it be nice if, or wouldn't it be terrible if, to isolate the necessary overcome outcome for the problem resolution. Think about what you want the solution to do or not to do. Think about the values that should be considered. Use the answers to these questions as the starting point of your goals or problem solving criteria. Additionally, the criteria for an effective solution to the problem should consider the following. Timing. Timing is the problem urgent. What are the consequences for delaying action? Trend. What direction is the problem heading? Is the problem getting worse? Or does the problem have a low degree of concern when considering the future of circumstances? Impact. Is the problem serious? Does it require action? Does it need an urgent solution? It is important to think about what these circumstances will look like after a successful solution has been implemented. 
Use your imagination to explore the possibilities for identifying goals or criteria related to the problem. Analyzing wants and needs. The creative problem solving process is a fluid process with some steps overlapping each other. Sometimes as the process provides additional information, problem solvers need to go back and refine the problem statement or gather additional information in order to effectively solve the problem. Wants and needs seem like a fundamental aspect of defining the problem. However, in order to analyze the potential solutions, the wants and needs for the desired state after the problem is solved must be very, very clear. Needs are items, uh, needs are items the potential solution absolutely must meet. If the potential solution does not meet a need requirement, you can disregard it for the further ana analyzing. Wants are nice to have items. You can provide a way to each item to indicate its importance. For each potential solution, you can provide a rating for how well the solution addresses the selected want. Multiply the rating by the weight of the want to score the potential solution. With scores for each item, it is an easy matter to rank the potential solutions in order to in order of preference. Using cost benefit analysis. Cost benefit analysis is a method of assigning a monetary value to the potential benefits of a solution and weighing those against the costs of implementing that solution. It is important to include all of the benefits and costs. This can be tricky, especially with intangible benefits or costs. Some benefits or costs may be obvious, but others may take a little digging to uncover. For example, imagine you want to replace three employees with a machine that makes stamps. A machine that makes stamps. You want to replace three employees with a machine that makes stamps. A hidden benefit is that you may be able to use large feed stock instead of individual sheets. Saving materials costs. In the same example, you would not only consider the salaries of the employees, but the total cost for those employees, including benefits and overhead. The value assigned to the costs and benefits must be the same unit which is why monetary value is suggested. The valuations assigned should represent what the involved parties would actually spend on the benefit or cost. For example, if people are always willing to save five minutes and spend an extra 50 cents on parking closer, they are demonstrating that time is worth more than 10, mi 10 cents per minute. That's what they're demonstrating, that time is worth more than 10 cents per minute. The considerations should also include the time value of money or the value of money spent or earned now versus money spent or earned at some future point. Module number nine. Selecting a solution. The next step in the process is to select one or more solutions from the possibilities. In the previous step, you will have eliminated many of the possibilities with a short list of possibilities. You can do a final analysis to come up with one or more of the best solutions to the problem. This module discusses the final analysis as well as a tool for selecting a solution called Paired Comparison Analysis. It also discusses analyzing potential problems that may arise with a selected solution. 
doing a final analysis. In the previous stage of the process, you performed a cost-benefit analysis. However, since we cannot always know all of the potential variables, this analysis should be the only one you perform. For each potential solution, you must weigh the potential advantages and disadvantages. Consider the compatibility with your priorities and values. Consider how much risk the solution involves. Finally, consider the practicality of the solution. It may be helpful to create a map for each solution that addresses all of the relevant issues. Consider the potential results of each solution, both the immediate results and the long-term long possibilities. In the final analysis, you will refine your shortlist and keep refining it until you determine the most effective solution. The final analysis. Then, the paired comparison analysis. The paired comparison analysis tool is a method of pri prioritizing a small number of workable solutions. The first step for using this tool is to list all of the possible solutions. Label each potential solution with a letter or number as you see in front of you. Next, compare the solution in pairs. A compared to B, B compared to C, C compared to D. Decide only between those two which solutions is preferable. Assign a number to indicate the strength of the preference for each option. For example, problem solvers could assign a 3 to items they strongly prefer, a 2 to a moderate preference, or a 1 to a mild preference, or 0 to some preference they do not even suggest. The first round continues two at a time until all of these solutions are ranked. Then all the ranks are added together to obtain a priority score for each item. The top score is the preferred solution. For example, imagine that a group of children are deciding which fairy tale to perform in a school play. They have listed six favorites. Number one, Sleeping Beauty. Number two, Cinderella. C or three, Snow White. D, Jack and the Beanstalk. E, Hansel and Gretel. F, The Three Little Pigs. Now, their chart may look like this. As you see right below, A with the B, the circle on the B, the circle on the C, the circle on the D, the circle on the A, the circle on the F, the circle on the B, the circle on the D, the circle on the E, the circle on the B. In this example, the clear winner is choice D, or Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk. Why? Because it had the letter D has the most circles. So after doing a comparison analysis, the problem solver came up with D as a solution. Only after doing the paired comparison analysis. Not before. You see, that is why it is very important to understand creative problem solving and to learn how to do the paired comparison analysis. Do try this at home. Do try it with your problems. Try it with your problems so that you can learn how to solve. So that you can learn how to solve them creatively. Analyzing potential problems. Think forward to the solution implementation. Ask how, when, who, what, and where in relation to implementing the solution. 
Does this imagined future state with this problem solution match the desired state developed earlier in the process? Brainstorm for potential problems related to the solution. Consider how likely potential problems might occur and how serious they are. These potential issues can then be evaluated as needs and wants along with the other criteria for evaluating the solution. Sometimes this analysis can uncover a potential hardship or opportunity that changes the criteria, problem definition, or even other aspects of the problem solving process. Remember to be flexible and revisit the other stages of the process when necessary. Think forward, brainstorm, evaluate, be flexible, jot them down, analyzing potential problems. Module number 10, planning your next steps, a very important module. Because many of us solve our problems, then we fail to plan. And failing to plan means planning to fail. Once you have selected one or more solutions to the problem, it is time to implement them. This module looks at identifying tasks and resources and re-evaluating the solution and adapting as necessary. Identifying tasks. This part of the creative problem solving process is the time to think about the steps for making the solution become more of a reality. What steps are necessary to put the solution into place? Brainstorm with people involved with the problem to determine the specific steps necessary to make the solution become a reality. At this stage of the process, working with a smaller group may be more effective, unless you need approval from a large group. While making that list, identify any tasks that are critical to the timing of the solution implementation. What are critical tasks? Critical tasks are items that will delay the entire implementation schedule if they are not completed on time. Non-critical tasks, on the other hand, are items that can be done as time and resources permit. Hence, identifying resources then becomes very important. This part of the creative problem-solving process is the time to think about the resources for making the solution become reality. What else is necessary to put the solution into place? The types of resources that may be involved are listed, as you see, along with some questions to think about to assign resources to the project of implementing the solution. Number one, time. How will you schedule the project? When would you like the solution completed? How much time will each task identified take? Personnel. Who will complete each identified task? Equipment. Is there any special equipment required to implement the task? Does the equipment exist or need to be obtained? Money. How much will the solution cost? Where will the money come from? Information. Is any additional information required to implement the solution? Who will obtain it? And how? So identifying resources is a process of creative problem solving. And without identifying your resources and 
including time, personnel, equipment, money, and information, know that something is missing in the process of your problem solving. Next, implementing and implementing, evaluating, and adapting. Once you have determined the tasks and the resources necessary to implement the solution, take action. Now is the time to use your pro your project. It's the time to use your use your project management skills to keep the solution implementation on track. On track. As part of the implementation process, you will also continue to evaluate the solution or solutions. It is important to be flexible and adapt the solutions as necessary. Based on the evaluation of the solution's effectiveness at solving the problem, you may need to make adjustments to the plan as new information about the solution Module 11. So now it should be clear and understood. Module 10. The last thing we talked about in Module 10 was implementing, evaluating, and adapting. Imagine coming up with solutions and plans for the next situation if it occurred. Without implementing, taking action, continuous evaluation, adjusting with new information, you will be standing in one place and you will be facing these difficulties and these problems over and over and your solutions will never put these problems to an end. So we need to take action, we need continuous evaluation and we need to adjust with new information because new information constantly comes in. We're always introduced to new information daily, every day, even when you wake up tomorrow, you will realize when you go to work or go to school, you will be introduced to new details, new information, whatever it may be. It may be details, information of the nature. It may be something that has to do with work. It may be something that has to do with math, but you will be introduced to new information. And if you are not able to deal with new information and to adjust with new information, then you will not be able to move forward in life with your creative problem solving skills. Module 11, recording lessons learned. Once you have solved the problem successfully, it is time to apply what you have learned to make solving future problems easier. Planning the follow-up meeting. Have a follow-up meeting after the solution has been implemented. Here are some things to consider when planning this meeting. Make sure make sure you have a clear agenda for the meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to conduct a final evaluation of the problem, the selected solution, and the implementation project. Use the follow-up meeting to find out if any of the team members still have frustrations about the problem or its solution. It is also time to celebrate successes and identify improvements discussed in the next two projects. Make sure to, to invite all of the team members involved with the creative problem solving process and the solution implementation. Make sure to consider the meeting arrangements such as refreshments and equipment needed. Invite the participants in plenty of time to make sure that all key members can be present for the meeting. Make sure each participant knows the purpose of the meeting so that all have the appropriate incentive to attend. Celebrating success. After the problem has been solved, what do we do? We take the time to celebrate the things that went well in the problem solving process. Try to recognize each person for their contributions and accomplishments. You can celebrate success by recognizing the contributions of the team members in the follow-up meetings. There must be follow-up meetings. Remember this. There must be follow-up meetings. It's a must. 
Alternative, alternatively, you can have a party or other form of celebration. A good activity just needs to help the team celebrate a job well done in coming up with all the solutions, evaluating them, and finally implementing a solution effectively. Identifying improvements. There have probably been some bumps along the road in the creative problem solving process. Take the time to identify lessons learned and ways to make improvements so that the next problem solved will be even better. Meeting with team members and stakeholders to identify improvements is a valuable exercise for several reasons. It ensures everyone is aware of the challenges encountered and what was done to resolve them. If someone is learned from a mistake or a failed endeavor, then the effort put into the task is not entirely wasted. Participants can apply these lessons to future problems to be more successful. Module 12, wrapping up, looks like we are coming to an end. And it looks like we have had a wonderful time. Maybe challenging, maybe some points were quite complicated because you were newly these points were newly introduced to you, but don't give up. Problem solving, creative problem solving is easy. And if you read this module, these modules, over and over a few times and apply one chapter at a time, within two to three months, you will be a creative problem solver in no time. You will be professional. People will look up to you at work. People will call you every time they have a problem so that you can solve them and you can actually make money solving people's problems. Although this workshop is coming to a close, we hope that your journey to improve your creative problem solving skills is just beginning. Please take a moment to review and update your action plan. This will be a key tool to guide your progress in the days, weeks, months and years to come. We wish you the best of luck on the rest of your travels. Let me share with you a few words from the wise before we call it a night or day, wherever you are, whatever time it is, and the place that you are located. John Foster Doles, former Secretary of State, says, The measure of success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but whether it is the same problem you had last year. Henry Kaiser said, Problems are only opportunities in work clothes. Albert Einstein, The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Amazing. So, last but not least, action plans and evaluations. What I want you to do is a quick round robin and ask somebody how they would solve a problem if they were put in that difficult situation or in that problem. Then compare what they said with what you learned and then teach them what you learned so that you can remember what you learned. Solving problems is easy and you can be a great creative problem solver. You can indeed and you probably already are. So do so and don't give up. You have attended this course and you have successfully completed it. I thank you very much for attending, for listening and watching and most importantly for taking notes and benefiting. Thank you very much. Until next time. And goodbye.